Charias and Calarho. Book 1. My name is Chariton of Aphrodisia, and I am clerk to the attorney Athenagoras. I am going to tell you the story of a love affair that took place in Syracuse. The Syracusan general Hermocrates, the man who defeated the Athenians, had a daughter called Calerho. She was a wonderful girl, the pride of all of Sicily. Her beauty was more than human. It was divine, and it was not the beauty of a narid or of a mountain nymph, but of the maiden Aphrodite herself. Report of the astonishing vision spread everywhere and suitors flocked to Syracuse, rulers and tyrants' sons, not just from Sicily, but from southern Italy too, and farther north, and from foreigners in those parts. But Eros intended to make a match of his own devising. There was a young man called Carias, surprisingly handsome, like Achilles, and Nyrus, and Hippolytus, and Alcibiades, as sculptors and painters portray. His father, Ariston, was second only to Hermocrates in Syracuse, and the two were political rivals, so that they would have made a marriage alliance with anyone rather than with each other. But Aros likes to win and enjoys succeeding against the odds. He looked for his opportunity and found it as follows. A public festival of Aphrodite took place, and almost all the women went to her temple. Claraho had never been out in public before, but her father wanted to do her reverence to the goddess, and her mother took her. Just at that time, Charius was walking home from the gymnasium. He was radiant as a star, the flush of exercise blooming on his bright countenance like gold on silver. Now, chance would have it that at the corner of a narrow street, the two walked straight into each other. The god had contrived the meeting so that each should see the other. At once they were both smitten with love. Beauty had met nobility. Charius, so stricken, could barely make his way home. He was like a hero mortally wounded in battle, too proud to fall, but too weak to stand. The girl, for her part, fell at Aphrodite's feet and kissed them. Mistress, she cried. Give me the man you showed me for my husband. When night came, it brought suffering to both, for the fire was raging in them. The girl suffered more because she could not bear to give herself away, and so said nothing to anyone. But Charias began to waste away bodily. But when Charias began to waste away bodily, he found courage as befitted a youth of noble and generous disposition to tell his parents that he was in love and would die if he did not marry Claraho. At this his father groaned and said, Then I have lost you, my boy. Hermocrates would certainly never give you his daughter when he has so many rich and royal suitors for her. You must not even try to win her, or we shall be publicly insulted. Then the father tried to comfort his son, but his illness grew so serious that he did not even go out and follow his usual pursuits. The gymnasium missed Charius. It was almost deserted, for he was the idol of the young folk. They asked after him, and when they found out what he had made him ill, they all felt pity for a handsome youth who looked as if he would die because his noble heart was broken. A regular assembly took place at this time. When the people had taken their seats, their first and only cry was, Noble Hermocrates, great general, save Charius. That will be your finest monument. The city pleads for the marriage, today, of a pair worthy of each other. Who could describe that assembly? It was dominated by Eros. Hermocrates loved his country and could not refuse what it asked. When he gave his consent, the whole meeting rushed from the theater, the young men went off to find Charius, the council and archons escorted Hermocrates, and the Syracusans' wives, too, went to his house to attend the bride. The sound of marriage hymn pervaded the city, 
The streets were filled with garlands and torches. Porches were wet with wine and perfume. The Syracusans celebrated this day even more joyously than the day of victory. The girl knew nothing of all this. She lay on her bed, her face covered, crying and not uttering a word. Her nurse came to her as she lay there. Get up, my child. The day we have all been praying so hard for has come. The city is here to see you married. Then, and then her limbs gave way. Her heart fell faint. For she did not know whom she was going to marry. She fainted there and then. Darkness veiled her eyes. And she almost expired. The spectators thought it was maidenly modesty. As soon as her maids had dressed her, the crowd at the door went away, and his parents brought the bridegroom in to the girl. Well, Charias ran to her and kissed her, and when she saw it was the man she loved, Clara Ho, like the flame in a lamp that is on the point of going out and has oil poured onto it, at once grew bright again and bigger and stronger. When she appeared in public, the whole crowd was struck with wonder, as when Artemis appears to hunters in lonely places, many of who, those present actually went down on their knees in worship. They all thought Clara Howe beautiful and Charius lucky. It was like the wedding of Thetis on Pelion, as poets describe it. But just as strife turned up there, according to the story, so did a malicious spirit here. The suitors were dressed and angry at their failure to win Clara Ho's hand, so whereas they had so far been rivals, they now fell into accord. In that accord, and considering themselves insulted, they joined counsel, and their marshal in the campaign against Charias was envy. A young Italian, the son of the tyrant Regium, rose to speak first. If one of us had married her, he said, I should not have been angry, as in athletic competitions only one contestant can win, but we have been passed over for a man who made no effort to win the bride, and I am not putting up with that insult. We have lain waking at the door of her house. We have curried favor with her nurses and maids. We have sent presents to the servants who brought her up. How long have we been her slaves? What is worst of all, we have come to hate each other as rivals. And with kings competing for the prize, this Nancy boy, this worthless pauper, carries it off without lifting a finger. Well, he must get no good of it. Let us make her, his marriage fatal to the bridegroom. They all showed their approval, except the tyrant of Acargus, who opposed the suggestion. It is not any goodwill towards Charius, he said, that makes me object to this design against him. It is prudence. Hermocrates, remember, is not a man to be casually disregarded. An open fight with him is out of the question. An intelligent approach is better. After all, that, that is how we become tyrants, by cunning, not by force. Elect me leader of the campaign against Charias, and I promise you I shall break up this marriage. I shall set jealousy in arms against him, and with love as ally, he will bring about a catastrophe. Clara Ho, I know, is sensible, and she doesn't know what malice and suspicion are, but Charias has been brought up in the gymnasium, and he does know how young people misbehave. It will be easy to arouse his suspicions and make him jealous, as young men are liable to be. Besides, we can approach him more easily and talk to him. They all acclaimed his proposal before the words were out of his mouth, and thinking him capable of anything, entrusted its execution to him. So he embarked on the following scheme. 